You're listening to BostonFreeRadio.com. Greetings and welcome to the show Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic Dan Burke and I have five movies to review for you for this show. First, let me get into a little bit of a disclaimer. The views and opinions expressed on this show are solely those of myself, Dan Burke, and do not necessarily reflect those of the people at Boston Free Radio, Somerville Community Access TV, or any of its members or affiliates. So with that said, let's get into what's topping the box office. These are the top 10 highest grossing films of this past weekend. Most of them can be considered hits, some not, but I'll let you know which are hits and which are flops right now. So debuting at number one in the top 10 is Pirates of the Caribbean, Dead Men Tell No Tales, which is one of the five movies I'm going to be reviewing for you for this show, and I'll do it after the segment. But this weekend it debuted, Memorial Day weekend by the way, to $77 million, which is not bad. And that's just in the United States. However, it has a long way to go considering that its budget is $230 million. However, internationally, in every other country, including the United States, Pirates of the Caribbean, I'll just say the fifth one, has made $324.8 million. So while it has a ways to go to become a hit here in the United States, it still is a tentative hit around the world. So it's off to a pretty good start. Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2 was number two at the box office last week, and it's number two this week in its fourth week in release. Turns out a lot of people wanted to have fun when going to the theaters this Memorial Day weekend, but the really great weather we had, especially in New England, might have kept people out of theaters, which is entirely understandable, because there have been better Memorial Day weekends, and this is just not one of them. But still, Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2 has so far grossed $338.5 million dollars in the United States against a budget of $200 million. So it is a tentative hit here in the States. However, around the world it has grossed $788.6 million, making it a tentative hit here in the States, but a certified hit around the world. Baywatch is the number two highest grossing debut movie of the week, but it debuted at number three this week. Not off to the best start. Yes, it's in the top five, but it was expected to do much better, especially since Dwayne Johnson is in the lead role. However, Baywatch grossed $23 million this weekend, and against a budget of $69 million, it grossed, again, as I said, $27.6 million here in the States, and $28.5 million around the world. So it's off to an even worse start than Pirates of the Caribbean, Dead Men Tell No Tales. At least I'm pretty sure that Pirates of the Caribbean will gross all its money back. Baywatch, it's not looking good for the movie so far. Alien Covenant, in its second week in release, debuted at number one last week. This week it dropped all the way to number four, having grossed $13.2 million in the United States alone this weekend. Against a budget of $97 million, though, Alien Covenant has so far grossed $60 million even in the United States and $161 million around the world, which makes it not a hit yet here in the States, but off to a pretty good start. But around the world, it is a tentative hit so far. It probably will become certified by next week. At least that's what I'm guessing. Everything Everything was number three at the box office last week when it debuted. This week, it's number five at the box office, having grossed just $7.4 million in the United States this weekend. Against a relatively modest budget of $10 million, though, Everything Everything is already grossed in just two weeks in the United States, $22.7 million. I don't have the international numbers for you yet, but in the United States, it's a certified hit already, which means vicariously around the world, it is also certified. Diary, excuse me, Diary of a Wimpy Kid, The Long Haul, debuted last week at number six. This week, still number six, amazingly enough. I expected this to drop, if not entirely off the top 10 altogether. But that's kind of based on my opinion as well as sort of the word of mouth I've been hearing about the movie. But regardless, Diary of a Wimpy Kid, The Long Haul, I'm just going to call it Diary of a Wimpy Kid 4 just to save time, grossed $5.8 million this weekend in the United States. Against a budget of $22 million, which isn't much, 
Diary of a Wimpy Kid has so far grossed $15 million in the United States in just two weeks, which is pretty good, and $17.7 million around the world, which means it's not a hit yet here in the States or around the world, but next week it could potentially be a tentative hit. We'll just have to see. Snatched was number four at the box office last week. In its third week in release, it has dropped to number seven and probably showing no signs of increasing. Snatched this weekend grossed $4.9 million. Against a budget of $42 million, Snatched has so far grossed $41.2 million here in the United States and $50.6 million around the world, which means it is very, very close to being a tentative hit here in the States, but it's not yet. Around the world, though, it is already a tentative hit. King Arthur, Legend of the Sword, is a movie that is struggling mightily. In its third week in release, it dropped from number five last week to number eight this week, having only grossed $4.1 million. Against a budget of $175 million, King Arthur, Legend of the Sword has so far grossed only $34.8 million here in the United States. Ouch. Around the world, it's showing it's doing a little bit better in every other country, including the United States. It has grossed $120 million, but it's still not a hit, and it's not looking like King Arthur Legend of the Sword is going to recover from this one. The Boss Baby, in its nine-week run, dropped from number eight last week to number nine this week, having grossed $2.3 million. And it's unlikely we're going to see this movie in the top ten next week. It may be number 10 if it's lucky however this weekend it grossed 2.3 million dollars against a budget of 125 million dollars the boss baby has so far grossed 169.6 million dollars here in the states and 476.2 million around the world making it a tentative hit here in the states but around the world it is most certainly a certified hit and finally, Beauty and the Beast, in its 11th week in release, is number 10 at the box office this week, having made $1.9 million. But it is a certified hit here in the States and around the world. That should go without saying. And it's amazing the numbers this has pulled in in its 11 weeks in release. Against a budget of $160 million, it has grossed $500.9 million here in the States and $1.23 billion around the world, which is pretty amazing. It's a hit. No need to feel bad for it. The first movie I'm going to be reviewing for you for this show is going to be Pirates of the Caribbean Dead Men Tell No Tales. This is the fifth overall Pirates of the Caribbean movie, and given that it's debuted at number one at the box office this week, it's probably not going to be the last. And this is actually the first Pirates of the Caribbean movie that has been released in six years. Just to give you a recap, the first Pirates of the Caribbean movie was The Curse of the Black Pearl in 2003. Then there was Dead Man's Chest in 2006, At World's End in 2007, and On Stranger Tides in 2011. Besides the movie I'm going to re review for you right now, the only one of the Pirates of the Caribbean movies I've actually seen has been the first one, The Curse of the Black Pearl, which I saw when it came out 14 years ago. So give, I usually have a rule with sequels, which is that I usually don't see the fourth or the fifth movie in a franchise, or even, you know, in the case of The Fast and the Furious, the eighth movie, unless I've seen the other ones first. But in the case of Pirates of the Caribbean, I have the feeling that the... The movies are a little bit more episodic than other franchises. That is, if the first movie you saw w was to be, for instance, At World's End, the third movie in the series, you wouldn't be lost because the the characters would still be there and they you'd be able to pick up, based on the story, how the characters actually are and maybe get a brief synopsis of what they were up to previously. So when I saw Pirates of the Caribbean, Dead Men Tell No Tales, even though I hadn't seen the last three, I really wasn't lost. So what is Pirates of the Caribbean, Dead Men Tell No Tales about? Well, I'm about to tell you. The brief synopsis of the movie is that Captain Jack Sparrow searches for the trident of Poseidon. Well, that's just part of the uh, plot synopsis. So let me give you a more detailed one. There is of course, the search for the Trident of Poseidon. And to this movie's, well, 
I would say to this movie's credit, but taking away from this movie, throughout the film, I got that the Trident of Poseidon was an important thing. I just didn't really understand why Captain Jack Sparrow and his compatriots were after it and what they would gain from having it. That being said, the, the movie actually did compel me from the fact that there are a number of dead pirates in this movie that are after Captain Jack Sparrow, as well as this Trident of Poseidon. But this is actually following the ending of At World's End, where a 12-year-old Henry Turner boards the Flying Dutchman to, his, to inform his deceased and sunken father, Will Turner, Orlando Bloom coming back from the dead, that the mythical Trident of Poseidon is able to break his curse, Will Turner's curse, and free him from his ship. So, nine years later, this young Henry Turner is now 21 years old, and he's working on a British Royal Navy warship. And while chasing a pirate ship, there is a giant ghost pirate ship that comes out of the Devil's Triangle, that is the Bermuda Triangle. Uh, and once this pirate ship reaches the British Royal Navy warship, a number of dead pirates come off of it, including Captain Salazar, who's played in this movie by a very scary and very convincing Javier Bardem. So Javier Bardem hasn't played many villain roles since his... Excuse me, getting a phone call, which I'll have to decline. So, as I was saying, Javier Bardem hasn't played many villainous roles since his breakthrough role in the United States as Anton Chigurh in the modern, classic, sort of Western crime movie, No Country for Old Men, directed by the Coen brothers, which I believe is actually their best movie to date, and that's saying a lot. And... The big reason that that movie was so great was because of Javier Bardem's chilling performance. In this movie, he looks scary as hell, and he is, and it's incredibly chilling, not only the CGI that's on him that makes him look like a living dead, but there's also a really cool effect they did, the, the special effect people did with his hair. They made his hair look like it was floating in water, even though his character was above water. And... I'm pretty sure that it wasn't just CGI. They also filmed this long hair in water and then used CGI effects to place it on Javier Bardem's head. But either way, it looks really, really cool. So Pirates of the Caribbean, the whole franchise, is a movie, that, is a movie series that is rated PG or PG-13. I think one of the big reasons this movie is rated PG-13 is because Javier Bardem and the other dead pirates in this film look so scary. And I think that's probably one of the biggest words of caution against parents who bring their children to see this film. But I liked the fact that this movie wasn't afraid to scare you. And I also actually really liked the story as well as the characters. So Johnny Depp is going through a little bit of a career slump right now. A number of his movies recently, whether they were for adults or whether they were for children, have bombed, which is probably one of the big reasons why he's come back to playing Captain Jack Sparrow. But fortunately in this movie... He's well adapted to playing his Academy Award nominated role. He was nominated for an Oscar for the very first movie. And he comes into this movie and he doesn't miss a beat. So even though I was a little confused about what the Trident of Poseidon did, I thought all of the characters in this film acted really well. Javier Bardem made a great bad guy. Johnny Depp fit into Captain Jack Sparrow really well. I also loved Jeffrey Rush returning as Captain Hector Barbosa, and I also thought Brendan Thwaites and Kaya Scodelario did a great job as the new additions to this film. So it served as a good tribute to the original film as well as a good continuation of the other films. And it gets my rating of a knockout. It was very fun to watch. I came into this movie having very little expectations, but those expectations were exceeded by... So I'm a the next movie I'm going to be reviewing for you is Baywatch. This is a film adaptation of the long-running show that was on for... A majority of the 90s. I'm not sure exactly when it began. I think it was sometime around 88, 89, but it was very successful. It was probably one of the most successful syndicated dramas ever. 
But I have not seen a single episode of the show Baywatch. I only know it by reputation. I know that it was technically billed as a drama, but the storylines were so absurd that it was very aware of its own self-deprecation. It was not afraid to self-deprecate, especially during the later years. But the movie Baywatch... I'm going into this with sort of an open funnel in the sense that I'm not obviously a fan of the show, and even if I was, I probably wouldn't have seen very many episodes of it anyway, but I'm just kind of judging this show for, or judging this movie for what it is, which I think is, it does it's not, I don't think, a faithful adaptation of the show, but then again, It doesn't really have to be. I think it probably served partially as a tribute and partially as its own movie, and I respect that. But the movie is about devoted lifeguard Mitch Buchanan, played by Dwayne The Rock Johnson, who butts heads with a brash new recruit, played by Zac Efron. Together they uncover a local criminal plot that threatens the future of the Bay. So... I came into Baywatch very much, very similar to the way I went into the movie Pirates of the Caribbean, Dead Men Tell No Tales, with pretty low expectations. Whereas Pirates of the Caribbean, the fifth one, I'm just going to say that to save time, exceeded my expectations. Baywatch really didn't. It was supposed to be funny, but it really wasn't. Of course, having Dwayne Johnson as the lead character is an asset, and having Zac Efron in there is also an asset as well, especially since he's proven himself to be more than just a pretty face in films like Neighbors, Neighbors 2, and also the one about Mike and Dave need wedding dates. Those were pretty funny movies, and Zac Efron was actually pretty funny in them. He was especially funny in Neighbors 2, which I seem to be the only one who thinks that Neighbors 2 is better than the original, but moving on. So Baywatch, basically, instead of being a good original comedy that pays tribute and also satirizes the show on which it's based, it ends up really being a cliche buddy comedy movie that's sort of like a cop film with all the cliches, and really none of the laughs. It's, it's one of those films where the second that Zac Efron and Dwayne Johnson go start to play off one another, it feels almost as if Zac Efron's character just came on and said, hi, I'm a young cocky guy who plays by his own rules and doesn't play by the team. Because that's pretty much what he does, and not in those exact words, That is pretty much what he says as well. I was also really disappointed in this movie by the fact that the female lifeguards who are playing alongside Dwayne Johnson and Zac Efron more or less don't have distinctive personalities. They are, I think, at least two out of three of them are depicted as strong characters, or at least women with strong wills, but... I'm just going to take back the strong character part. There really isn't a lot to them. They're great looking. They look great in a one-piece bathing suit, which they damn well better, right? But there's not much else to them. In addition to that, there's also another character here who is played by an actor I don't recognize by the name of John Bass. And John Bass is kind of a pudgy kid. Very much the antithesis of Dwayne Johnson and Zac Efron. Basically, even with a shirt on, you can tell that he doesn't have the same kind of body as the other two. So the fact that he doesn't, he's not particularly good looking, he's chubby, and he has curly black hair immediately ma- makes you believe that he's going to be the comic relief of this movie. And he tries way, way, way too hard to be funny, and he doesn't have any of the charm that somebody else like Seth Rogen would have had had he been playing this role. Plus, he plays a guy in his mid-twenties who has a crush on one of the blonde lifeguards whose whose character's name is C.J. Parker, and she's played by a lovely young woman named Kelly Rohrbach. But it's one of those things where... Kelly Rohrbach comes onto the screen, she's running in slow-mo, and the characters are commenting that she's running in slow-mo and saying that's kind of weird, kind of like they did on the show, nothing too original there. But when she starts talking to 
the character of Ronnie Greenbaum. The, the guy can't get any words out. I have seen this kind of characterization in so many sitcoms. So many of them. And it's really nothing new here. In addition to that, John Bass is just not an original character. So the plot of this movie is of a woman named Victoria Leeds, who's played by Priyanka Chopra, who is running a drug cartel on this beach that the lifeguards are patrolling. And there's that usual buddy cop cliche where the people who are not qualified, according to the police, to investigate this case of the stolen drugs, or rather of drugs perpetrating the beaches, are investigating it. There's always there's that fallout in the middle where the police say, you're off the case, and the police are absolutely right. These lifeguards are supposed to be protecting the citizens of the bay, not investigating drug cartels. But this movie just delves into so many cliches, does nothing with it. It has a few there are a few times where i chuckled but not enough to give this movie anything more than a strikeout instead i'm giving it a flunk out i would the only way i'd rate it higher higher is if maybe dwayne johnson had funnier lines maybe even if zach efron had funnier lines and if the female characters priyanka chopra included had more to do with their roles but unfortunately they didn't the next movie I'm going to be reviewing for you is Everything Everything. This is a movie that came out last week, and I kind of wish I had seen it to review for last week's show, but unfortunately I didn't get the chance. Well, I did finally see it, and I'm reviewing it for you now. And I, I basically skipped it because I didn't think it would be as big as a, a, as big a hit as it ultimately was. But sure enough, it debuted at number three. It still held... A little steady as at number five this week. And I'm actually glad I saw it to review it for you now. So, Everything Everything is a movie that's not, doesn't have an original title, but it's the title upon, of the book upon which this movie's based, written by young adult author Nicola Yoon. And it's about a teenager, a, a female teenager, who spends her whole life t confined to her home in Los Angeles until she falls for the boy who moves in next door. So the girl in this movie is, a, is Maddie Whittier, or at least that's her name, and she's played by a young actress, a very young actress, who's only 18, whose name is Amanda Stenberg, who, those of you who are fans of the... The Hunger Games franchise will know her from those films. And she's been in a couple of other movies as well. So the, the deal with the, the girl in this film, why she's confined to her house, is because she has a condition which is called SCID. And SCID is uh, an acronym for Severe Combined Immunodeficiency. So it's something that a lot of people are born with. It's not like AIDS, where it's a, a syndrome that's contracted by a virus. Um, so basically, severe combined immunodeficiency means that one's white cells are weak, and they can pretty much get allergic to and hence killed by just about anything, especially in the outdoors. So this character, Maddie Whittier, is more or less confined to her house, albeit it is a very nice house, and she has a caring mother who's played by Anika Noni Rose, who is also a doctor. But, of course, you can't keep a 17 or an 18-year-old confined to the house without her wanting to leave, especially for the boy who moves next door, whose name is Ollie Bright, and he's played in this movie by Nick Robinson. So I haven't read the book Everything Everything, so I'm not exactly sure if the characters in the film were supposed to be of a certain race. I do know that the author, Nicola Yoon, is an African-American woman, and I would presume that the character of Maddie Whittier is supposed to be African-American as well. But with the book being the fact that I haven't read it, I don't know. However, I do applaud this movie for the fact that there is 
an interracial relationship in this film, and that's not the focus of the film. I actually do like the fact that this movie took a risk by not addressing the taboo of there being an interracial relationship. And this is a move that I don't think any movie would have made 10 years ago or even five years ago, but it seems to be something that's thankfully more readily accepted in today's society. For that reason, I applaud the movie a lot. And I did also think that Nick Robinson and Amanda Stenberg have great chemistry together. Once he is actually allowed to enter her house, albeit behind the back of um, Maddie's mother, who again is played by Anika Noni Rose, I thought the two of them had really made me feel like they were both attracted to one another and later on in love. However, the movie, after maybe about 45 minutes, didn't really connect with me in terms of credibility, in the sense that I began to wonder to myself, is this woman who has skid, which is severe, uh, severe combined immunodeficiency, it, does her mother actually expect her to live in the same house for the rest of her life? Couldn't she be maybe taken to a hospital and given some sort of probiotics or antibiotics or even some other revolutionary treatments to make her better again? And then a, a certain twist is revealed about the character of Maddie Whittier that is convenient for the plot, but not convenient for the people who are watching it. And that's when I began to really question the credibility of this film. And I do acknowledge that it is fiction, but it just doesn't seem right to me or even realistic to me, regardless of the resources that this girl has, um, Maddie Whittier, and the, the, the fact that she has her support network, that people would just expect her to be in a house for the rest of her life. I just didn't, I didn't really get behind that. And I also, as the movie progressed, I began to think this, mo this woman has to get out somehow. How, how are they going to keep continuing on with this? So the movie gets a strikeout in my book, not because of the acting. I think everybody in this movie acted well with what they were given. I didn't even think the dialogue was all that bad. I really just liked a lot of things about this film, but then the movie's credibility went south, or rather went plummeted after the, the twist was revealed and after you learn a little bit of something about Maddie Whittier's mother's intentions and why she made these kind of intentions. At first, I thought to myself, I really believe that Anika Noni Rose and Amanda Stenberg were mother and daughter, respectively. And I liked also, initially at first, the fact that Anika Noni Rose's character was not the evil, wicked stepmother that's keeping the Rapunzel-like character in her castle. But I do think there were some of those fantasy elements that when worked into the real world, didn't quite mesh particularly well. I can't say the same about the book because I haven't read it, but for the movie, it just didn't work for me, but it didn't make me angry. Words on Film is the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. The next movie I'm going to be reviewing for you is Fist Fight. This is a movie that came out in theaters actually a couple of months ago. Its initial release date was February 17th, and I did see it when it came out, but I just didn't have time to review it when it came out. However, it is now out on DVD and can also be found in streaming on Amazon Video as well as other streaming services, of which I don't know at the moment, but don't be surprised to see it streaming on Netflix sometime soon. Fist Fight is a movie that takes place in a high school, and it's about two people who are going to be engaged in a fight at the end of the day. The only thing is, unlike most movies that take place in high school, the two people who are in a fight are not students. As a matter of fact, they are teachers. There's one well-meaning teacher, who's played by Charlie Day, who's an English teacher, and another far stricter teacher of U.S. history, who's known as Strickland and who's played by Ice Cube. So 
Initially, when you look at Charlie Day and Ice Cube, when you're asked who do you think is going to win in a fight, the, the answer is probably going to be Ice Cube. And if you bet on Charlie Day, you might get a lot of money if he wins, but most people are probably not betting on him. So Ice Cube and Charlie Day play teachers who are not exactly rivals at first, they seem to be on relatively good terms, even though Ice Cube has a rough exterior. But in altercation with a troublesome student where Ice Cube literally takes out a hatchet and chases the student with it, results in both of them, both Charlie Day and Ice Cube, being in the office with the principal to determine what's going on. Well, Charlie Day wasn't an accomplice to this outburst and let's face it assault by ice cubes character but he did witness it and he did actually try to intervene however there's this certain unwritten code of silence that teachers have according to this movie that results in ice cube in influencing charlie day's character for a little while not to rat on him Otherwise, there'd be consequences. And when Ice Cube tells you there's consequences, you better damn well listen. I mean, I'm six foot three and a half and probably much taller than Ice Cube actually is, but I wouldn't want to get into a fight with Ice Cube and neither would Charlie Day. But when Charlie Day is threatened with being fired by the principal, who in this movie is played by Breaking Bad's Dean Norris, he does... I. I'm not going to say rat out Ice Cube, but very understandably, he does explain exactly what happens. So much to Strickland's, that is Ice Cube's character's chagrin, Charlie Day does say exactly what happened, and Strickland challenges him to a fight at the end of the day. So rather than Charlie Day's character just getting in his car and leaving, after all, it is the last day of school, he... He is sent into a, a bit of a panic and is trying to get this fight off. He's also in, in any way possible. And it goes from actually bribing some students to um, even alerting the authorities as to what's going on. So this movie in theme is very similar to an underrated teen movie that came out in the late 80s called 3 O'Clock High. 3 O'Clock High is not a movie that John Hughes had any involvement with that I know of, either as a writer, director, or a producer, but it's one of those underrated gems of the 80s. One of the only problems with that movie, 3 O'Clock High, is that the kid in the movie who's going to get into a fight with the big bully doesn't look like a high school kid. He looks like he's a guy who's, who's barely out of college, and the, the actor who was playing him was actually balding when the movie was being filmed. But besides that credibility hump, Three O'Clock High was actually a pretty intriguing movie. Fist Fight seems, doesn't exactly pay tribute to Three O'Clock High. In fact, it doesn't seem aware that Three O'Clock High is actually happening, despite the fact that the plot elements are exactly the same. Also, this movie probably wouldn't have happened, and this is probably the most contrived part, if Charlie Day just got into his car and left. And as I said, this is the last day of school in this film, which presents another credibility challenge. It is the last day of school. The kids at school are going wild. But here's my problem with it being the last day of school. One, on my last day of school in high school, every year, the last day of school would be finals. So everybody would be there who has to be there, or at least who has to have a test, but the halls would be quiet and people would be taking tests. In this movie, classes are still in session and people are still teaching classes as if their students are going to pay attention. And it seems like these teachers are young enough to remember what it was like in high school for them and what the last day of school that wasn't finals was like for them. In fact, as a it just seems like a lot of people, a lot of the students in the school who are causing trouble and actually vandalizing school property don't seem to be dedicated enough to even show up to school. So there's that problem with this movie. And even though there are some very strong comedic supporting performances by the likes of Tracy Morgan, who despite being 
pretty out of shape and having a noticeable beer gut, plays Coach Crawford. There's also the, the guidance counselor, Holly, who's played by Jillian Bell, who tries in vain to interfere with this fist fight, but there's but to no avail. And there's also a good, there's also a pretty good supporting performance here by Christina Hendricks, who plays French teacher Ms. Monet, who turns out to have a chip on her shoulder against Charlie Day's character, Mr. Campbell, as well. So, again, there are some good comedic performances in this film, or at least performances by good comedic actors. And Christina Hendricks is not someone I particularly found funny, or she doesn't exactly have to be funny, but she played it straight, and vicariously, she actually was funny in her role. But the credibility of this movie is completely lost to me when, again, this fight could have been averted if Charlie Day's character had just left, had just walked away. It does take the bigger man to walk away after all, right? And even though Ice Cube put his all into this film and played intimidating, which he is very good at playing, I have to give this movie a strikeout because the events of this movie are more or less completely contrived. And some of the comedic foils don't work. The next movie I'm going to be reviewing for you is one called Don't Knock Twice. It is a horror film that it was out in theaters briefly and is coming to streaming and maybe DVD of... Well, it's, it's going to be available for streaming on June 6th, 2017, which is, as of the time the show is being recorded, next week. So it's directed by Caradog W. James, and yes, Caradog is his first name. He is a Danish director, and he has directed a number of films before this, including The Machine from 2013, which I haven't seen, but it's a sci-fi horror film that stars Toby Stevens and Katie Lotz. But this is the first film I've seen by him, and it's a movie that deals with an urban legend. Uh, specifically one that is in London. And it's a movie about a mother who is desperate to reconnect with her troubled daughter, and she and her daughter become embroiled in the urban legend of a demonic witch. This urban legend goes that this demonic witch lives in a house that is in a rundown part of London, and teenagers are dared to knock on the door twice. And if they do, then kind of like the Bloody Mary urban legend, this witch will haunt them for the remainder of, well, their existence until either they die or they find some way to outsmart or run away from this curse successfully. So there isn't a lot that's original about Don't Knock Twice. In fact, I've probably seen dozens of films just like this. I was hoping this would be more original, seeing that it takes place in London and it's directed by a, a Danish director. But unfortunately, there's not a lot to this. And once the... At first, the, the witch, when she begins to haunt this, this troubled daughter, who in this movie is named Jess, and she's played by a young actress named... Oh, I'm sorry... Uh, the, the mother's name is Jess. The, the daughter's name is Chloe, and she's played by Lucy Boynton. Her, so Lucy Boynton is a British girl, and her mother is actually American. Her name is Jess, and she's played by Katie Sackoff. So once this girl, Chloe, gets haunted by this, this witch who lives in this, this rundown house, which you're not supposed to knock the door twice. It, it, she just appears and then disappears and then appears again and disappears. And at first, I began to flinch whenever I saw this demonic witch on screen. But after a while, the pattern of her appearing and disappearing and appearing and disappearing and sort of those false scares, I began to see exactly when they were coming. Also, as these urban legends go, you find out that this demonic witch is through this daughter and mother's research actually Russian, which almost made me think of that line that Michael Palin shouted at the Frenchman played by John Cleese in Monty Python and the Holy Grail. Specifically, what are you doing in England? 
I mean, I get that. We, we live in a day where anyone from any country can be an expatriate in another country at any time. But I really couldn't get behind what the Russian woman was doing in England. If she was escaping Joseph Stalin, that would have been one thing. But the movie never delves into that. And also, the, the scares at first made me flinch, but eventually they just wore off. And once they wore off, I began to really not care about the witch and or even about their victims. And there's even one part where the witch drags one of the characters to this alternate dimension. And when I say alternate dimension, it almost makes it sound as though I'm talking about a science fiction film, but it really this alternate dimension is much is a much creepier version of Earth where this demonic witch drags her victims. And once you're watching this film and you're wondering why this witch or this being dedicates so much energy and time to haunting this particular victim, you really just don't care about the movie. It just seems like haunting for convenience sake. It's not a movie I absolutely hated. One of the things I loved about the film well, was not only the first initial scares before they wore off, but I liked the, the set design as well as the lighting of this film. I thought the lighting of the film was nearly perfect. Yeah, it was dark, but of course it's a movie about a, a, a dark subject, and demonic witches are never usually light. I get that. But if the story had been a little bit more original and a little less predictable, and if there maybe had been a, a bit of a twist I didn't see coming, I probably would have liked this film a lot more. But as it stood, I saw it actually as a midnight movie, a couple of months ago, I, I saw it at midnight. There were some times where I nodded off during the film, but it's probably because the story didn't exactly catch my interest. I do think that now that people are going to have access to it soon on video on demand, I think people might appreciate it more watching it at home or maybe even be more scared by it watching it at home than in theaters. But I don't know. I've heard that The Ring, the, the movie with Naomi Watts, the American version, was more scary to watch at home than it was in theaters. And I could actually see, see that happening because one of the big themes of The Ring is a videotape. And when you're watching a videotape play on a big screen, it's not nearly as scary as watching it on a TV at your house. It certainly was particularly scary for me, but I think The Ring was probably the exception to that rule. Don't Knock Twice gets my rating of a strikeout because it, it shouldn't have gotten into a pattern that the audience could have easily predicted, that I could have predicted. And once a movie gets into a pattern, you can see the scares coming and the scares wear off quite a bit. They certainly did with this movie. The acting wasn't bad, but the fact that it got predictable and the fact that the storytelling wasn't exactly as original as it should have been is the reason I can't quite recommend this movie, although it might be scary at home. You'll just have to wait and see. And now that I've reviewed all five movies I had to review for this show, it is now time for me to get into my next segment, which is what's coming out next. This is a brief audio preview of movies that are coming out this coming weekend. And there are a lot of big ones. First and foremost, this is a movie that should have been made a year ago in place of, or at least before, Batman vs. Superman Dawn of Justice. It is the long-awaited Big screen adaptation of Wonder Woman. I can't say whether this movie's good or not, but I can say, however, that one of the best parts about Batman vs. Superman Dawn of Justice, which was a relatively mediocre movie, was introducing Gal Gadot as Wonder Woman. Well, this time she has her own movie, and this is the movie that should have been made, as I said, before Batman vs. Superman. But because we live in a country that's elected an inexperienced man over a very experienced woman for president, I think movie studios just, well, didn't really trust a, a big screen adaptation of a woman 
character first. It's sad, but it's just the way Hollywood works sometimes. So before Diana was Wonder Woman, she was the princess of the Amazons, a trained warrior. And when a pilot crashes and tells of conflict in the outside world, she leaves home to find a war to end all, to fight, excuse me, a war to end all wars, discovering her full powers and true destiny. So this movie not only stars Gal Gadot, but it also stars Chris Pine and Robin Wright, as well as Lucy Davis. And I am really excited for this movie. I can't tell whether it's going to be good or not, but as I said, Gal Gadot was the one of uh, probably the best thing about Batman versus Superman. And it, I, I'm not going to repeat what I just said previously, but I will say that I will see this movie. And when I do, I'll let you know what I think about it next week. Another movie I'm going to see is a movie based on a very popular children's book, very much in the, line, in the vein of Diary, Diary of a Wimpy Kid, except this one is Captain Underpants. And this one is probably more for children than it is for tweens and teens, but it's one of those books that has gotten a lot of attention over the last couple of years. But this movie is officially called Captain Underpants, the first epic movie. It's a little audacious for a movie like this to call itself the first, because it may be the last, but we'll have to see whether it's good or not. But it's a movie about two overly, Im in a, excuse me, two overly imaginative pranksters. Let me start over. Two overly imaginative pranksters named George and Harold, who hypnotize their principal into thinking he's a ridiculously enthusiastic, incredibly dim-witted superhero named Captain Underpants. Unlike Diary of a Wimpy Kid, any of the movies, Captain Underpants is actually animated and features the voices of Kevin Hart, who probably doesn't play Captain Underpants because, well, let's face it, Thomas Middleditch, Ed Helms, and Nick Kroll, amongst others. I am very interested to see how Captain Underpants is. It is one of the movies I'll be reviewing for you next week, and I'll let you know what I think about it when I see it. I, <laughs> the, the character design itself makes me laugh, so I can't wait to see what the rest of the movie is. Hopefully, fingers crossed, it is actually good. Another movie that's coming out, it says in wide release, but I can't m imagine much wider release, is a movie called Dean. This is a movie that's directed by and starring stand-up comedian Dimitri Martin, who at one point had his own show on Comedy Central. I'm not sure if he still does. But it's a comedy about loss, grief, and the redemptive power of love, even though those three things don't equate to a comedy. But it's about a guy named Dean, hence the title of the movie, who is a New York illustrator who falls far... Who's far excuse me, falls hard for an L.A. woman while trying to prevent his father from selling the family home in the wake of his mother's death. So I'm not too familiar. I'm familiar with Dimitri Martin's stand-up comedy, which is pretty good. He's a good, clean comic. But I am not actually familiar with how he does as an actor in movies. I know he was in a movie about Woodstock, which was directed by Ang Lee, and, and that movie kind of came and went. It was sort of a flash in the pan, but... The people who I, who I know who saw that movie thought it was pretty good. If Dean is out in a the theater near me, and I don't know if it's going to be, I'll see it and I'll let you know what I think. But just to let you know, the movie not only stars Dimitri Martin, but it also stars Kevin Klein, Jillian Jacobs, and Mary Steenburgen, amongst other people. So that just about wraps things up for Words on Film for this week. Just a reminder that the views and opinions expressed in this show are solely those of mine, Dan Burke, and are not necessarily reflective of anybody who works at Boston Free Radio or some of the community access TV or any of their affiliates or the station as a whole. So with that said, thank you so much for joining me. Words on Film is the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. And this is your host and movie critic, Dan Burke, saying, I'll see you at the movies.